Oh, what's this? But, but it was my birthday months ago. Oh, oh episodes. 50th episode, right, okay. Not going to be much evidence of this cake left in a minute. Hello everybody, welcome to the Re-Review, the series where I get to replay and reassess games from my favourite gaming era. I'm Brian, also known as UKJ and Zoidberg, and I find it really hard to believe that this is already my 50th episode in this series. In the previous 49 episodes, I've looked into a number of Amiga games, some all-time classics, and some probably best forgotten. I've also had taken time to look at the people who made them, and I've covered a number of the most well-known developers on the Amiga, learning a little bit about each one along the way. I'm not stopping there though. There are still many more games for me to cover that I reviewed in the pages of Games X and Amiga Action, and I've also just launched the Viewer Choice episodes last time out. You can find, find details of how you can get involved in those in the video description below. In this episode, the game that I'm going to be taking a look at is Switchblade 2 from Gremlin Graphics, which was released in early 1991. Switchblade 2 was one of a number of games developed internally at Gremlin Graphics, who were one of the most well-known software publishers of the 8 and 16-bit eras. Based in Sheffield, they actually started out life as a small computer store called Just Micro, before being expanded into a full software house in 1984. The three company founders were Ian Walker, Kevin Norburn and Jeff Brown, and they quickly set about making hit games for the Spectrum and Commodore 64. Working in-house at Gremlin, were a number of very talented programmers and artists, many of whom you've probably even heard of. Peter Harrop and Sean Hollingworth created the Monty Mole series and would go on to found both Tech Software and Chrysalis, whereas the great Tony Crowther would go on to make the Amiga role-playing games Captive and Liberation, before becoming a senior programmer at both Criterion Games and Sumo Digital. We're here to talk about another less well-known but equally talented programmer, however, George Allen produced Venus the Flytrap in 1990, a game which was published by Gremlin and impressed the bosses so much that both he and artist Paul Gregory were chosen to make the sequel to a, a popular core design title that they had published in 1989. Witchblade had been designed and programmed by Simon Phipps, who had made both Rick Dangerous games and would go on to make both Woolchild and Bubba and Sticks. It was an anime-inspired platform game in which you played a character called Hero, who was fighting through multiple levels in order to try and retrieve a legendary weapon. It was probably most well known for the fact that areas of the screen would not appear until your character entered them, and for its intricate single fire button combat system. For the sequel, Alan and Gregory retained a number of the same features, but managed to actually make a game that felt like a different game entirely. The reviews were strong, and when it was released in May 1991, it entered the Amiga charts at number one managing number 9 on the All Formats chart. Paul Gregory remained at Gremlin working as an artist on a number of console versions of their games, but he was also a member of the team that produced the Amiga version of Top Gear 2. To find a home at Eurocom, working as a character designer on games based on Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the Ice Age movies and James Bond 007. Alan's expertise at making games with smooth full-screen scrolling was put to good use in 1992 when Gremlin decided to enter the race to produce a new platforming mascot for the Amiga. The result was Zool Ninja of the Nth Dimension, whatever the Nth Dimension is, and the result was one of the most hyped games of my time as a games reviewer. It was also one that received a number of the highest review scores as well. He stayed in the platforming genre for his next game, Pitfall The Mayan Adventure for Activision. That game came out in 1994 for the SNES, Mega Drive and Atari Jaguar. And maybe it's because there were so many platform games around at the time, but it's one that has been long forgotten by most gamers. Which is a shame, as I remember it being a lot of fun. His most recent credits include Zool Redimensioned, which came out in 2021, and working as a production supervisor on Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. Bigger versions of Switchblade, Switchblade 2 and Venus the Flytrap are all available to play today on Antstream if you're curious. Switchblade 2 was one of those games where I reviewed it for its budget re-release. It had been reviewed in the May 1991 issue of Amiga Action, when I was still sat across the office working on Games X. The reviewer had given it 90% and placed it at number 1 on the platform game Super League. My review came in the November 1992 issue, 
when the game was re-released on Gremlin's budget label GBH. This was common practice in those days, for a game to release at full price, usually around $24.99, and then come out just over a year later for $9.99. This meant that I was already well acquainted with the game having played it on its original release. I thought the graphics were excellent, and my only real criticism of the game was the length of the opening level, which I felt went on for far too long. This is a fine platformer. Graphically, it is superb, with each level looking different from the last, and succeeding in setting an atmospheric feel to the game. I gave it a score just a little bit lower than the original at 82%, saying that this was definitely a game for you if you liked a challenge. My score compares to the ones that appeared in all other Amiga magazines. Is it still worthy of that score today? Let's find out in the playtest. It's the first thing that strikes you is, is just how good the graphics are on this game. It's definitely um, close to console quality. For anyone that was a fan of the first game, it was nice that the opening section of this one had a very similar graphical style. Just to basically let you know that the two games were linked. You've got two different types of jumps that you can do. You can just jump normally, which takes you to about that height. If you crouch and push up, then you'll jump double the height. And the game makes good use of that. So once you're down into the... Uh, into the complex itself, you start to get um, something more like the original game, where sections of the of the map don't appear until you walk into them. But what you also get is lots of secrets, like that one there. I do like the fact that they get, the game gives you two different types of weapons. You've got like a little sword for close for close combat that's got that's pretty powerful, but then you've also got your bullets that you can use. Gives you that little bit of risk and reward because you have to try and conserve bullets and you can do so by getting close up close and personal to the enemies. It rewards your curiosity in terms of exploration with things like um, this extra life here which I think was, was a really nice touch having the extra life icon basically be the character from the original game. Thought that was a really good uh, little nod from the uh, developers. These spikes that just appear randomly. Once again, there is no telltale signs that they're going to appear. You just kind of have to know that they're there. So on your first playthrough, you're going to get hit by them quite a lot. I am playing this with the... Um, with the C64 joystick that you can use for the A500 Mini. Um, this is not... this game doesn't really lend itself to a joypad control. Right, so that, that glowing entrance there is the shop. I think I can afford the spinning spikes, so let's get those. Spinning blades will cost 30 credits, so yeah, let's take those. Now, once you've got these weapons, you have to be very careful not to run out of ammo, otherwise you lose the weapon. As good as this opening level is, I do feel like I was right in my original review in there. I said that the opening level goes on a little bit too long. Because you you kind of want the, 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 the first section of a game that you get to, to not take anywhere near this length of time to do. Needs to be like a little intro little introduction to the, how the game works. I am desperate need of some health again now. Oh, you absolute sod! It is good how when you lose a life, you don't return to a checkpoint, you just carry on from the point where you actually died. So now I'm back on the surface, I just need to make, make my way across to the right, and then I'll come to the final boss of the level. It's 
just basically a war of attrition. Can you kill it before it kills you? Oh, finally got it. There we go. And there's the first piece of the blade. From here on in, the levels are more along this line, this sort of line where it's all outdoors. It's a little bit disappointing that there's no uh, there's no secret areas to discover anymore, like there was on the previous level. Oh, there you go. There's another trap that I couldn't see come in. There was no way to uh, tell the difference between that piece of flooring and one that doesn't fall away. Does that a little bit too often as well, where I went through a doorway and got hurt without any way of avoiding it because there was a gap, there was a enemy stood right there. Need to buy the dragon and an extra life. Unfortunately, what you uh, what you gain from having the dragon, you also lose by not having any bullet, not having the ability to fire any bullets anymore. That dragon's certainly a lot more powerful when it comes to killing those things. No. It's so frustrating when that kind of thing happens. Yeah, I definitely need some health because just up that little bit in the middle there is where the boss where the boss fight is. Right. Let's see if I can do this. Is that taking it's taking the dragon away from me. That's annoying. No, you. And so once again, it's just a free for all until I can get rid of some of these bullets. It's just, it's just too much randomness to it. I must say that visually, this level is a little bit reminiscent of um, Assassin. From Team 17, but that game wouldn't actually come out for another two years after this, so maybe, maybe I should say Assassin looks like this. This is easily the most annoying level so far, though. Just constant things appearing that you've got no way of defending yourself against. Oh, okay, game over. So let's leave the playtest there then. Uh, move on to uh, the final summary. I still have a love-hate relationship with Switchblade 2, even after all these years. It's one of those games that begins brilliantly and then gets progressively worse the further you get into it. I absolutely love the first level, and really wish that the game had continued in a similar vein. It has multiple routes, hidden secrets, and absolutely rewards exploration. Yet as soon as you reach level 2, you can kiss all of that goodbye. Instead, it's all replaced with enemies that you can't see until you're on top of them, lots of blind jumps, and traps that spring up out of nowhere without warning. The third level in particular is especially annoying. It really is a shame, as the graphics remain excellent throughout, and there's a good selection of weapons that you can purchase from the in-game shop. The power jump move is a really nice touch and soon became second nature. The sound effects are also good, but the game would have definitely benefited from some in-game music, especially considering how good the theme music is by Barry Leach on the title screen. End of level bosses are another area where the game frustrates, with each one attacking with an almost unfair barrage of fire with no discernible pattern. You may think, after all those criticisms, that I don't like Switchblade 2, but the fact is, I still do, which makes all of the little flaws so upsetting. It was still good enough to sit in the recommended section of the action platform Super League, which I did a couple of months ago, when it could, and perhaps should, have been challenging for the top spot. So for me, it's going to get a disappointed 7 out of 10, but I'd still think that it's a game that you should play, 
especially if you like a playable platformer. Thank you for watching this 50th episode of The Re-Review. If you have watched all 50, I'm eternally grateful for your support and thank you for sticking with me as you've seen my presenting style drastically improve. If you have missed any, then there's a link to the full playlist which is probably on screen right about now. Next time out is another Viewer Choice episode and the game that won the members only vote was Stardust. So make sure you come back in two weeks time to see what I think of that one. All opinions expressed in this video are entirely mine and not those of the UK Gaming Network team. If you agree or disagree with anything that I've said in this video, then I would love to hear your opinions in the comments. Please do give us a like and subscribe to show your support for the channel and make sure that you check out the video description to find out how you can become a VIP member and get involved in choosing what games I cover in future episodes. You'll also get to watch them early. Until next time, happy retro gaming, bye for now.